Now let all loudly sing praise to God the Lord. Christendom proudly laud him with one accord. Gently he bids thee come before him. Haste then, O Israel, now adore him. Haste then, O Israel, now adore him. For the Lord reigneth over the universe. All he sustaineth, all things his praise rehearse. The angel host his glory telling. Psalter and harp are the anthem swelling. Psalter and harp are the anthem swelling. Come, heathen races, cast off all grief and care. For pleasant places your Savior doth prepare. Where his blessed word abroad is sounded, pardon for sinners and grace unbounded. Pardon for sinners and grace unbounded. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we plead for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee and of thy will and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and hath given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he giveth power to become the sons of God, and hath promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Amen. Our psalm for today is Psalm 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I call on the name of the Lord. O Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple-hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore I said, I am greatly afflicted. And in my dismay I said, all men are liars. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have freed me from my chain. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. So far, the Son we pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without whose aid and blessing all our labors are in vain, we ask you, regard your goodness and our need, and bless us, that in your name and with firm trust in you, we may patiently and cheerfully labor in our calling, honor your word, and evermore praise you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and governs with you in the Holy Ghost, 
one true God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is found in the book of Jeremiah, the 16th chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. However, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when men will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up from the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them. For I will restore them to the land I gave their forefather. But now I will send for many fishermen, declares the Lord, and they will catch them. After that I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt them down in every mountain and hill and from the crevices of the rocks. My eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their sin concealed from my eyes. I will repay them double for their wickedness and their sin, because they have defiled my land with the lifeless forms of their vile images, and have filled my inheritance with their detestable idols. O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in time of distress, and you the nations will come from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers possess nothing but false gods. Worthless idols that did them no good. Do men make their own gods? Yes, but they are not gods. Therefore I will teach them. This time I will teach them my power and might. They will know that my name is the Lord. So far, the Old Testament lesson. Our epistle lesson is found in Peter's first epistle, the third chapter, beginning with the eighth verse. Finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because of this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good, he must seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. So far in the epistle lesson. Our gospel lesson is found in St. Luke, the fifth chapter, beginning with the first verse. One day Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let the nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Here ends the gospel lesson. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. To thee, our God, we fly for mercy and for grace. O oh, hear our lowly cry, and hide not thou thy face. O oh, Lord, stretch forth thy mighty hand, and guard and bless our fatherland. The church of thy dear Son, in flame with love's pure fire, find her once more in one, and life and truth inspire. O Lord, stress forth thy mighty hand, and guard and bless our Father. O let us love thy house, and sanctify thy day. Bring in thee our vows, and loyal homage pay. O Lord, stretch forth thy mighty hand, and guard and bless our Father. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is found in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, beginning with the 43rd verse. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. And then he added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angel of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is our text. Dear fellow redeemed, it's July. In fact, I, this is the second Sunday, right? It was on the second Sunday of July, 42 years ago, that I was ordained and installed as a pastor. This is the month that many seminary graduates are installed as pastors. It's been several months since I last saw the figures or heard of them. But in our church body, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, we have about 125 pastor shortage. And when we look at how we obtain more pastors, there is both a human part and a divine part to this process. I heard of someone who already at the age of three was telling people that he was going to tell people about God. Some may have a desire to be a pastor already at an early age, and others may need a word of encouragement or two or much more. And our Wells pastors receive a certain amount, call it extensive training, to become a pastor. Our Michigan Lutheran Seminary in Saginaw, along with Northwestern Prep, are both high schools designed to prepare people for the public ministry. Then follow college and seminary. And when the training is done, the student receives a call, and we call it a divine call. The human part of the process is nearly complete now. Here comes the divine part. 
The student doesn't seek the place where he desires to serve. After all, the calling process is not like taking job interviews and finally taking the job that pleases you the most. The man does not seek the call, but the call seeks the man. And yes, there are duly authorized men who issued the call to the graduate. And yet at the same time, the Holy Spirit is working through these leaders to call the graduate to serve at a particular congregation. I don't remember anymore, but I think it's close to a year ago I received a call to serve another congregation. At that point, you can say I had two divine calls. The one I was currently serving at for Paul the Apostle and Zohar, and the other was the new call for another congregation. Obviously, I could not do both, so I had to keep, uh, keep one and return the other call. And the Holy Spirit led me to continue to stay at Paul the Apostle and Zohar. So, let me review what I've said. There is both a human part and a divine part to someone becoming a pastor. The human part includes desire and, and encouragement from other people, plus much study and training. Then comes the divine call in part human process and also the divine part, namely the Holy Spirit is directing the process so that a certain man goes to a certain place. And in the text before us, we see both the human and the divine parts of the calling process before us. We see Jesus calling Philip and Nathaniel. Jesus says, follow me. I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things. Our gospel lesson today is the miraculous catch of fish. The story begins with Jesus teaching the people from a boat a little offshore. When he finished teaching, he told Peter to go fishing. Peter was an experienced fisherman. And from his experience the, the previous night, he knew the fish were not biting, so to speak. But Peter still did what Jesus asked him to do. And there was a huge catch. In fact, so many that they needed help. Enough fish that two boats were at the point of sinking. Peter realized that Jesus had done him a huge favor. And the contrast between that divine favor and Peter the sinner was such that Peter confessed his unworthiness. Then Jesus told him, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Note well, Peter did not seek to become a disciple of Jesus. It was Jesus who sought Peter. Our text is a report by the Apostle John on how Jesus called several other disciples. And later they became apostles as well. The next day, well, let's... Go back to the previous day. On the previous day, John the Baptist was talking with two of his disciples, and in the distance he saw Jesus walking along, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples that John the Baptist was talking with went and followed Jesus. They spent some time with him, we finally learned the name of one of them. His name was Andrew. And Andrew went and found his brother Peter, Simon at the time, and he brought him to Jesus. And that's when Jesus gave him the name of Cephas, or Peter. The other of the two disciples is not named. It's John's custom not to refer to himself. And very likely that other unnamed apostle was John. Our text picks up on the next day. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Note well what it says here. Jesus found Philip 
Jesus called Philip. The call was simple, only two words. Follow me. And again, note the order here. Philip was not seeking Jesus, but Jesus found and called Philip. And since Jesus is not just a man, but also true God, Jesus gave Philip then a divine call. Now the call I received from you and Paul the Apostle is much more than two words. Just the, the names of the two congregations is already more than two words. It has the signature of the appropriate officers from both congregations. That's the human part but it's also a divine call. And the letter clearly says that it is a divine call. The human part and the divine part of the calling process is further illustrated as the story before us continues. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Bethsaida is mentioned here, and apparently Philip, Andrew, Peter are all from the same town, and apparently they must have had a good synagogue there because both Andrew and Philip were familiar with Moses and the prophets. In other words, what we today call our Old Testament, but in those days it was the Bible because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. It does not seem it took very long for Philip after he met Jesus to see Jesus as the fulfillment of what the Lord promised through Moses and the prophets. So what does Philip do with this newfound knowledge? He shared this good news with his friend Nathaniel. Now, good news is something that we share naturally. When, when the young lady gets an engagement ring, she Hides it in your jewelry box? Uh-uh. It goes on a certain finger, right? And, and she expects others to see that. In fact, when people don't notice, she might go like this. Have you seen? Seen what? I would say. And, and then she would explain to me my ring. She's excited because of the good news that it represents. And so Philip shared his new joy with Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel wasn't so sure about that report. Nazareth, he says? Can anything good come from there? Well, think about it. The scripture does mention certain towns. And Bethlehem is one of those towns mentioned concerning the coming Savior. But Nazareth is not mentioned by either Moses or the prophets. And since it wasn't mentioned, Nathaniel was not very impressed. Philip's answer was not to debate the issue, but simply come and see. And the simplicity of those words should not be overlooked. Jesus did not call us to win debates and arguments with other people. We are simply to be a good witness. Simply tell people to take a good look at Jesus and see for yourself. And with those words, then Philip set the stage for Nathaniel to meet Jesus. And when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. See how it reads here? Jesus spoke to Nathanael as though he already knew Nathanael. On display here then is the fact that Jesus knows all things. The big word that we use for this is omniscience, meaning all-knowing. And only God is all-knowing. Only God knows all things. And here Jesus demonstrated he is true God by showing that he 
new things about Philip that he did not physically see. Jesus called Nathanael a true Israelite. In other words, Nathanael was not just a Jew in name only, but the heart of Nathanael was in the proper place. He was trusting in the Lord. Jesus describes Nathanael as someone in whom is nothing false. And I saw a paraphrase of that this week that said, in whom is no Jacob. And that brings up a, a, a really a lively picture. Jacob who deceived his brother in order to get the inheritance. In fact, he was called a deceiver by some people. And Nathaniel was not like Jacob. He was not a deceiver. Jesus knew this. He also knew when Nathaniel was under the fig tree. And so clearly the divinity of Jesus is on display here by his knowledge of things. And Nathaniel drew the proper conclusion. He declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And note well, two very important things are said here about Jesus. He calls Jesus the Son of God. In other words, Jesus is true God. And secondly, Nathaniel called Jesus a king. And from our catechism days, we learn that his office as the Christ is threefold, that he is prophet, priest, and king. And note well, Jesus does not correct Nathaniel's confession regarding Jesus. And that's because there's nothing to correct. Jesus is true God. He is king over all creation. Jesus said to Nathanael, Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. Nathanael had observed that Jesus knows all things, and he drew the proper conclusion. And now Jesus promised Nathanael that he would see greater things. Now, think about where we are in terms of time here. It's near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Many things happened after Nathanael was called. Jesus changed the water into wine, for example. The daughter of Jairus was raised from the dead. The widow's son, Omnan, uh, was, was raised from the dead. Jesus healed the blind and the deaf. Then, of course, came Holy Week, culminating in the suffering, death, and yes, Jesus coming out of the grave again alive on the third day. All these greater things Nathaniel got to see. And no doubt, these things strengthened his faith in Jesus. And we can thank God that the Holy Spirit led the apostles to record these greater things in a book we call the New Testament. By means of this eyewitness reporting, we too have seen then these things, and these greater things serve to strengthen our faith in Jesus as well. And then Jesus added one more promise. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angel of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And note those words, the Son of Man. The word Son of Man sit very nicely next to the word Son of God. Because Jesus is both Son of God and Son of Man in one person. This is a divine mystery. And by mystery I mean something that we would not know about Jesus, that he is both God and man in one person, if God through Scripture had not revealed this truth to us. Because the Jews 2,000 years ago had false ideas regarding the Christ. Jesus often used the expression son of man to avoid misunderstanding about himself. And then, note the words, the angel of God ascending and descending on the son of man. 
It's an obvious allusion to the dream of Jacob in which he saw a stairway leading to heaven. Because the work of Jesus reconciled us to God, heaven is open to us, and Jesus is the stairway to heaven. Yes, indeed, Nathaniel and all of the disciples and uh, indeed saw the greater things that Jesus did. Jesus called them to share these greater things with the world. Jesus, our King, still calls men to be pastors today. And no doubt many a seminary graduate has had many friends and relatives along the way to encourage him to continue his studies and prepare for the ministry. And Jesus, our King, use all of this as he continues to call pastors into the ministry for our benefit. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all of our understanding shall keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray. O Jesus, Lord of the church, who commanded that men shall preach salvation in your name, we pray for our pastor who is your servant. Through the Holy Spirit's enlightenment, give him true understanding of your word and sanctified wisdom to handle it correctly. Let him never become guilty of believing and teaching false doctrine. Let him boldness to take a firm stand against all that is false and sinful, to repu reprove, rebuke, admonish, and exhort the hearts and souls of sinners. Fill your servant with the holy fervor to feed the flock under his charge with the precious gospel which alone can comfort sinners and save those who believe. Fire him with the enthusiasm of a true missionary, that he may be compelled to go out into the highways and byways of this godless world to call sinners to repentance and invite them to the feast of salvation. Bless his labors with much fruit that many hearts may be strengthened and many souls won through the word he preaches. And as we ask your grace through the spirit for the pastor, so we plead a similar blessing for the members of his flock, Cause them to be receptive to the word he preaches, setting their hearts aglow with faith and love for you, their Savior. May they never act contrary to your word, but always live in harmony with it, thus giving an honest profession of a sincere faith. Cause them to be a continual source of inspiration and encouragement to their pastor in his divine calling. Promote peace and harmony together with mutual love and understanding between God's servant and God's people. Dear Savior, we, both pastor and flock, humbly acknowledge our many sins and ask to be forgiven for the sake of your suffering and death on the cross. In your own good time, take us to our eternal rest in heaven, where, together with the angels and saints, we will still serve you with endless, pure devotion and be filled with wondrous glory. Here is for the glory of your name. And we join in the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee, be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace.